Mrs. Kamlesh Kapoor is a historian, educator, and an independent researcher with a master's degree in economics and a master's degree in education. She was among the first 20 women to be directly selected in the Indian Central Services. And she has been teaching for over four decades in schools and colleges, interfaith groups, and government departments with diverse staff. Mrs. Kamlesh Kapoor has developed a curriculum framework of teaching about diversity and multiculturalism, which is currently in use from kindergarten through grade 12 in schools and in universities. In addition, she guides students from various universities in writing papers on comparative religions. Mrs. Kapoor is the author of several books and papers, Portraits of a Nation, History of Ancient India, Hindu Dharma, A Teaching Guide, Cooking for Life, Cooking for Delight, Freedom Struggle and the Role of Mahatma Gandhi, which is under publication, and The Lost Generation. The last one is a critique of cultural and social determinants of drug abuse and deviant behavior. A keen observer, Kamlesh Kapoor has traveled widely, studying people, comparing cultures, and witnessing free and not so free societies. In her opinion, the understanding of Indian culture and civilization with its overarching aspects must be the most significant part of one's education. Kamlesh Kapoor is deeply committed to reaching that goal and teaches young children the basics of Hindu dharma and the meaning and relevance of chants and prayers. Nine of Mrs. Kapoor's lectures on Hindu dharma may be found on YouTube under the umbrella of the American Hindu Academy. Please welcome Mrs. Kamlesh Kapoor. Raji, for uh, saying so much about me. Um, so we can, uh, my name is Kamlesh Kapoor, uh, as she has introduced, and uh, namaste, and we can start uh, about the history of ancient Indian civilization in the global context. Now, why do we need to study Indian history at all? Uh, a new Indian history, I mean. It has already been uh, written several times by different people from different perspectives. And uh, why in the global context? Because the entire world history has been written wrong and uh, out of scientific context. Plus, it is most of it uh, conjectures and speculations and hardly much of evidence from Indian sources, even from uh, the global uh, scientific uh, uh, sources. So today we are just going to be touching the basis, how to start, where to start ancient Indian history and what has gone wrong so far uh, that we are not building up proper chronology and giving a proper uh, sequence of events as early as 15,000 BC, uh, common era. So let us go over some of the fundamentals of uh, sources of history and what has been going on with the uh, how they are playing with the history of ancient India and its civilization. Next. So my motivation was that so far what I have seen, and I must have reviewed at least uh, 15 different uh, textbooks from time to time and given reviews of that and fought for proper history book. So my motivation was that nothing, no effort, joint, or with the groups went anywhere. So they have given mythical start. And then in the timeline itself, there are so many jumps, um, as if we are blowing away the history of uh, millennium. Uh, and then there is speculation. There is uh, hardly evidence. 
So they are filling up uh, the hypothesis is uh, assumptions are like that. And the information that comes out is disjointed and inaccurate. And I tell you from a student perspective and from a teacher's perspective, these are the most boring books. One wonders why, why are we reading all this? It makes no sense. There's no cohesiveness. Plus there is a bias perspective. So they have taken some Greek sources, some Roman anecdotes, somebody's diary, somebody's uh, uh, accounts and like that. Significant events are totally omitted. So difference between, uh, there's a difference between Anuman, which is guessing. Inference, how do you make an inference from guessing? And speculation, all you come out is with speculation. So therefore, what we are, I'm going to, um, in fact, in the book, what I have done is, I have first put the evidence from different angles, different studies, a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, then uh, there's no room for inference because we have uh, you know, the evidence itself. So there's not much room for speculation either. Um, it is uh, either the fact or uh, it is uh, non-fact. So there cannot be in between a partial truth. Either it is truth or it is not. Next. So Max Mueller, um, and this is how the world is introduced to India uh, by Max Mueller in 19th century, German historian. And he dates the Vedic hymns to 15,000 BC. This was his earlier um, opinion. And uh, probably that was more accurate in, than when he started putting uh, the biblical uh, perspective and uh, what the British had asked him to do, which means distort the Indian history. So Sanskrit words used in the earliest Vedic literature uh, are not used properly. For example, he has used uh, Arya. Instead of Arya, he has used Aryan. Arya in Sanskrit is uh, Shri, Sir, a way of um, addressing somebody, Mr. So-and-so, Arya so-and-so, and for women, Arya Putri, so-and-so. So Aryan is not a Sanskrit word. It is neither a noun nor related to any language, much less to any race. And he has played with this particular word in every single way, linking it with the languages, linking it with the races, Caucasian and all that. So that itself is to be demolished first. Then perception and experience precedes linguistic expression. So people who are uh, developing languages and communicating with each other, they have a certain perception of the world or around what goes on around them. They experience, they have an emotional experience, they have a visual experience, there is mind to absorb, come to a certain conclusion, and then they try to communicate. So therefore, the words which are in the context of Indian culture or Indian emotional experience, uh, they are missed, wrongly translated. In fact, deliberately they are uh, chosen to write uh, wrong, uh, wrong translation. For example, jati. Jati literally means born or that comes into existence. So that is the birth, uh, the surname. Brahmanism, there is no such word Brahmanism. Uh, either it is Brahma as a divine entity or it is a Brahmin as a, a, a group of teachers and Vaityas and other sannyasis. Then there are Adivasi. Adivasi literally means having a republic of their own, their own customs and laws and not related to any kingdom. 
So India was a vast, uh, India is a vast uh, subcontinent. Now it is split between different uh, other nations. But in the beginning, uh, it was just one whole subcontinent. And there were several kingdoms, uh, culturally uh, very cohesive and connected. And the history goes back, uh, continuous history goes back several millennia back and there were no such thing as tribals and there were no such words as brahmanism uh, jati was there but uh, the other two words were not there for arivasi the word was uh, republics so bhugol now this is uh, the indian word for geography bhu means earth gola means spherical. So literally that means we are talking about the earth which is spherical and round. And anything which is wrong and then they have also mentioned the planets and the gravity of their forces. Anyway, those things are specifically showing that not only the earth is round and spherical but it moves around its own axis and around the sun. So sun is the center, not the earth. Now Brahmandam. Brahmandam is galaxy. Andam means that which is like an egg, elliptical, oval. And the galaxy itself is uh, in that shape, elliptical, not completely round. So Anu is particle, atomic particle. Pramanu is a sub subatomic particle, molecule, and Darshan Shastras, they deal with the, uh, all subjects in detail relating to psychology, physics, uh, analysis, and uh, uh, specificity, uh, and justice system, balance, yoga, all of this is in Darshan Shastra. So you understand from this preview that there is much more to Indian civilization than just projected as Aryan invasion and <clears throat> the various kind of uh, invasions on India and what they brought to India to enrich it. Next. So the, now I'm just giving uh, one of the uh, writer's opinion. Um, and uh, there will be quite a few opinions and as you can read yourself that he, uh, uh, Rico says, the truly edu educated man can admit his mistakes without feeling that his per personal worth has been diminished. See, It is not that his ego is coming in the way. The uneducated man clings to his mistakes with all the more determination when others point them out. So this is what is happening to the Western academia and Indian academia, surprisingly, after the independence, they should have, by this time, produced credible history book and traced its uh, proper history. And he further adds, to him, the critic is an enemy who attacks him by showing him up. In public debates, the uneducated man rises in anger to defend national cliches, slogans, illusions against anyone who urges that these unsupported beliefs may be abandoned and truth be faced. The uneducated man has made these fancies his own and not only he, but all his students and the vast uh, coterie of reviewers and peers they all support him. So this is the difference. And Indian view, uh, even when presented in, uh, uh, on the platform in conferences, it is considered an uh, Indian-centric view. Now, I don't understand history of India can be written from Eurocentric view or Chinese-centric view. Does it make sense to anybody? So this is an, a, a useless kind of label that what we are saying, producing as evidence, is Euros, uh, Indian centric view. It has to be Indian centric view. Next. 
Now, key elements of historiography. Now we are coming to uh, if that premise is not right, <clears throat> then what is right? So where are we going to get the sources and how do we uh, categorize them that these are primary sources, original scriptures uh, in oral tradition and in poetry. And then there are secondary resources as the philosoph philosophical discussions and uh, uh, diaries and anecdotes. So stories written. So those are, and then we verify, uh, collect the evidence from all these sources, and then we check the credibility by cross-referencing. Does it tally with the, the uh, from the uh, evidence from the physics or from glaciology or marine archaeology, paleobotany? All of these disciplines have brought out um, much earlier dates of the beginning of human civilization after the Ice Age. So we don't have to start with the uh, nonsensical things like uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens because that happened uh, uh, about one and a half billion years back. And we are talking about history uh, recorded after the last Ice Age. So we are in the current era where we are not talking about prehistoric times. So that kind of uh, shirts and uh, pottery showing is totally, totally uh, not relevant. Now, how to sift the evidence? So that is important. Now, evidence which is to be thrown out and which is to be considered credible. So now there comes the approach of the writer, the compiler. After having sifted through, corroborated everything, checked uh, the dating and the chronology, finding more evidence and tallying it, is the writer himself or herself honest enough? Is he biased? So there is something called in uh, academia, it used to be called uh, academic sincerity. Does the writer have that academic sincerity that he is writing what he actually has found out and compiled? Next. So here we comes with theory versus empirical data. Aryan invasion theory. Now, what is the key word here? Theory. It means it's only an assumption. It's the basis of a, a hypothetical basis of constructing some kind of structure of uh, history. So, what should we be accepting? A theory or what is the evidence? I am showing my two hands. You cannot have a theory about it. Then maybe there are three hands and maybe there are 15 fingers. Empirical data. The, the thing is right there, staring at you. So we, I have taken the book. I may not be able to devote as much time, but there are 17 holes in this theory. On 17 grounds, we can just discard it, throw it away. So in spite of the overwhelming evidence disproving AIT, Western academia has clung to this outdated theory, as if they are wedded to it for eternity, to the theory itself. And that brings the relevance of the quote, which I have given earlier. Next. Okay, so how do we now debunking the AIT? And I'm focusing on that because unless we demolish the very first uh, introduction to history that it is not correct, then we go on to build a proper chronology. So here in the, the next few slides, all we are doing, I am doing is 
that we are uh, uh, debunking on various grounds. Now, where did the Aryans come from? Now, here again, you know, since it is a conjecture, a speculation, some say they came from the North Pole. Some say that it, they came from the Caucasus Mountain. Some say Asia Minor, some Central Asia, Iran. So, claim of each place needs to be examined and uh, verified according to the uh, actual shape of the globe. In terms of ecology, uh, language structure, internal evidence from the literature, fauna and flora, because so many of uh, um, birds and uh, landscape and the vegetation, they are described in the Vedas, which do not exist even today in any of those above mentioned places. There is no such thing as uh, uh, a peacock or a chakori in Caucasus Mountain, in Asia Minor, Central Asia recently they have been taken, those species. Iran, yes, because that is contiguous, but not anywhere else. And we have to see the rivers. So tested against documented, then all of this evidence is to be tested against archaeological find. Now this is the internal evidence <clears throat> from the uh, uh, Vedic literature, post-Vedic literature, and pre-Vedic uh, literature. And then we corroborated with the ecology. How was the earth after the first, I, uh, this last ice age? Then we take the internal evidence from literature and then we focus on the language structure and references in that. And then we see the landscape and the geography and the rivers. So when we test all, all these put together, then we find the archaeological <coughs> evidence, <coughs> whether it is uh, under the water or it is under the uh, on the surface. So, next slide. Okay. So, now we come to the, the another occupant, uh, before we go to the, um, uh, to the evidence, we come to a place called Germania. It, the word is in uh, ancient German language, archaic language, and uh, they say that uh, maybe the Aryan came from Germania, which is Germany. And this is the premise for uh, uh, <clears throat> Hitler declaring the supremacy, superior race of Germany based on that the Aryans were born and they were civilized and they took the civilization to India. So Aryans originally came from Germany and now they need to be civilized, whether by the British or by anybody else. So now let's see what was happening in Germania. Even the National Geography has produced so many of the series um, about the ancient uh, world, ancient Europe, actually. And they, they do not mention Germany uh, as, uh, as a race or as a civilized place even. They were tribes. They were very savage because of the mountain region and uh, very harsh uh, climate conditions. There was hardly any civilization. Civilization happens when there are people who are settled in one place. Then they, these were small tenements, which contained, you know, the animals and the humans all stayed together. Fewer than 25 people lived in one place. So the forest fog, the harsh weather, snow covered peaks. All we have to do is look at the geography of that place. It is between Alps Mountain and further up towards the North Pole. So even today, the climate is not, not as uh, uh, hospitable as in a tropical country. 
So some of the famous uh, tribes were, and these are the names, Goths and uh, Armenri and Teutons, and they existed even till the 4th century AD. So till the Christianity came there and the Roman Empire vanished. Uh, by the way, Roman Empire uh, up to 2nd century was not even uh, a Christian Empire. There was no Pope there, no nothing. It was just <clears throat> a Roman uh, Republic Empire. And Greek Empire, a similar kind of thing, small islands, a Roman Empire, small islands, and uh, around the Mediterranean region. So they were the first to emerge out of the uh, Ice Age uh, because they are closer, A, to hot water of Mediterranean, B, uh, closer to the uh, Tropic of Cancer. So that determines uh, very much uh, where those candidates were. So civilization could not have started 15,000 years BC. They were under Ice Age. Uh, in Germany or in Northern Asia, Tundra, much less North Pole. You see, some people are hilariously uh, ridiculous. Okay, next. <clears throat> so since these are all uh, conjectures and speculation and each coming out with his own theory, uh, the start of civilization in deserts and mountains is so jumbled up. Suddenly we come up with Sumerians and Babylonia and places like that uh, vying for um, early start of civilization. Again, these were desert civilizations and mostly they were located around uh, two or three river basins, very small, if you see the geography and especially the globe. Fixing the rise of civilization, this is another thing that came up in the fourth century. They started that nothing could have happened in the entire, on the entire planet before the 4004 BC. So that is why everything comes out, you know, such and such empire came, 3000 BC, such and such empire. Because according to the biblical date of creation, the creation happened on the planet Earth um, 4000 years um, back, before Christ. So nothing could be older than 5th century millennia. And that is where that uh, time frame comes up uh, everywhere. Uh, Egypt, 3000 year BC, Indus Valley and everything. So incidental archaeology, anthropology, artifacts given as evidence, shirts and potteries, you see, this is uh, uh, neither here nor there. They are not even evidence. It is just picked up a few art artifacts to fit into the framework which is already created. So they have the start. It cannot be more than 7,000 years back. Whereas their own uh, geology and uh, this, this uh, uh, paleobotany rock structure shows uh, and the marine life shows that life had started about two and a half billion years. So the, this creation myth has influenced and distorted Indian history. So we are going to take back Indian history instead of from 1500 BC to 10, 15,000 years back. The entire history of 10,000 years is missing from the history books. Okay, next. So as I said, it is very hard, even if we present the scientific context, it's very hard to destroy the bedrock of Western studies. 
because they do not want to change their theories. So knowledge base of 16th century, what was the knowledge base of? We have removed the biblical creation theory uh, with the, their own scientific evidence. But now come, let us come back to what were the European scholars thinking in 16th century? They were thinking the earth is flat and uh, earth is the center of the uh, creation, universe or whatever they call it. So that ideology, that level of ignorance, there was no astronomy. If there was any that was destroyed by the uh, by Christians in uh, early 5th century when they destroyed Alexandria library and they also destroyed many Greek libraries. So they destroyed evidence, literary evidence. So <clears throat> now let's go to linguistic. So we cannot go to ideology. We cannot go to their uh, popular beliefs prevailing when Max Muller wrote the um, history. Now, incorrect translations, because I already explained that the words do not have the same meaning. There are certain words in languages, in Sanskrit and in Hindi and in other Indian languages, that experience is not there. So you cannot translate. So Atma is not translatable word and mm, soul is not a word corresponding to anything in Indian experience. So therefore we are going to focus on geology, climatology, geography, glaciology, astronomy, marine archaeology, epics, Vedic literature, epics and ecology. So when you are putting together these are the hard sciences and they are to be taken in the evidence to be taken into consideration. Okay, next. So now see, proper study of historiography requires a close look at the geography, topography, elevation and latitudinal position environment, climate conditions of ancient regions and countries of the world. Um, I forgot to pick up the globe. Normally I keep it on my desk. Uh, as uh, the viewers are studying these artifacts, chess pieces and the fire altar in different places, uh, I'm going to grab the globe and show you the real uh, geography and glaciology. This is the globe. So, what is the most prominent thing here that the civilizations start in the center part, 33 degrees uh, north and 33 degrees south. This is the best place for civilization to start because the climate is not harsh. Too cold below that, too cold above that. So 40 or 50 degrees above uh, the equator, north or south, it's very difficult uh, to even have agriculture. Siberia, there is hardly much of uh, uh, agriculture. So you can see uh, now the Himalayas, we call it Himalaya. India is uh, right here. India is right here, you can see right here, let's see how to focus it, uh, yeah, and Himalayas above that is uh, 
the largest source of glaciers. From these glaciers come the crisscross rivers. Some move towards the Arabian Sea, some move towards the Bay of Bengal. So, and all of these, they start from Himalayan glaciers. And they are crisscrossed, several rivers, tributaries. Then there are co coastal mountains down below, towards the peninsula part. And these coastal regions have mountain ranges. And these mountain ranges uh, have their own river systems. So they start from the mountains and either go to Arabian Sea, like Narbada and Tapi and Sabarmati, and some go to some go to uh, Bay of Bengal, like Kaveri and others. So we see now uh, the geography and the role of glaciology. Now, where are the glaciers here? This part is desert in Africa, and Europe is much above the 33 degrees north. So they don't have the, that kind of unfrozen sources of uh, river system. The elevation, topography, which means you have to have plains for cultivation. Not the, all mountains do not have cultivation. Rocky mountains have very little uh, uh, eatable or agricultural farmland. And similarly, there are many other places. So we have to consider that too. Then we have to see uh, the plains, uh, how much water they get, not just from the uh, rainwater, but from the perennial rivers. And we see that. So climatic conditions. Uh, logically, without even exercises, much of common sense, we can see that tropics are the regions where the temperature is neither too hot in winter, in summer, and not too cold in winters. So it is like temperate, very tropical climate. Of course, it gets very hot in uh, near the equator, but then they have their own kind of uh, forestry, vegetation and everything. So scientists want historians to use these considerations, empirical data, to reach scientific evidence-based conclusions and do not come out with the baseless uh, irrelevant theories and conjectures. And uh, we assume, this is a Britannica encyclopedia, we assume. Why we assume? Then there is evidence. Okay. It is assuming I have 10 hands when I can see only two. So this is where I do not want people to see the map because the bulge is not clear, which is attracting the direct solar rays for longer period of the year. So this is where the globe comes in instead of a picture of the globe. Now, let's go, uh, no, just before that, these are the chess pieces right here. And they are dated, uh, carbon dating, 5000 BC. Lothar is the, near the um, southwest very close to uh, Ran of Kutch, uh, a little above Bombay. These are the fire altars and water is kept there for purification. And this is also in Lothal. And uh, uh, this is from Indus Valley, I mean, up north, uh, between uh, Saraswati and Indus, which is, uh, which has five, six different uh, river valleys. Many of the rivers are not there today because of the earthquakes and <coughs> excuse me, uh, platonic, uh, this uh, tectonic plates 
they shift, uh, the rivers, uh, the courses change instead of flowing this way, they flow this way. So that naturally changes <clears throat> the climate and uh, um, valleys and farmland. So this desert, which everybody talks about, Thar Desert. Thar Desert uh, in the uh, long history of the uh, Indian subcontinent, Thar Desert came around, uh, say, 7,000 years back, even uh, later. Uh, I should say 6,000 years back when the monsoons uh, pattern change, there were drought. And then some of the rivers, because of the earthquake, instead of moving south southwest, <clears throat> they moved north, uh, southeast and parallel to the Ganges. So that deprived some of the rivers of uh, uh, the tributaries, tributaries water. So Saraswati became dried. But recently, um, with the help of satellite imaging, they have been able to see underground water channels showing that there was a river uh, starting from the Himalaya all the way uh, to, towards Bombay. Next. Now, New methods of finding and dating evidence. Uh, this is relevant. This is where I was going. That once we have found that there is water uh, satellite imaging and it trace scanned, just like they scanned the ridges of the um, uh, that Adam's page, which is uh, called uh, Ram Setu in India. Um, actually, it is uh, mountain ridges and they are joined together um, by shoals and it becomes a bridge. That bridge came up. We knew the existence, we know the bridge as Indians, uh, but for the West, it was quite a discovery uh, through satellite imaging that there are ridges supporting the bridge. So they can scan dried up river and deltas of the river. And then they do the, whatever is found, um, some of them are not uh, a possible to be dated, but most of them, my artifacts, can be carbon tested and they have been. So this method has come up only in the last about uh, four decades or so. Um, and th that is how they dated the rice husk which was found in Bihar and the paleobotany and they found the husk and then the carbon dating was done and they said that it is 15,000 years uh, before Christ. Next. Greek and Roman sources of Indian history. Now, their criteria. Their criteria for evidence is Greek and Roman sources of Indian history. Why? Why not Indian sources of history? We are writing about Indian subcontinent. And when you use the uh, Greek and Roman sources, look at what they quote, that India was primitive and uncivilized. Here is a very ridiculous kind of uh, remark, I mean, it's uh, amazing that Alexander remarked, these barbaric Indians loved music and dance. And this is quoted in Cambridge History of India, which is based on Greek and Roman sources. So <laughs> this is almost, uh, uh, I would say, makes no sense. How can a person who loves music create symphonies, dances, creates gestures and expressions and acting to match? How can they be barbarians? Who are they killing? And what, what is the brutality done by them? 
how does this adjective come? And that is proven by, uh, I mean, used by an entire plethora of history books written by the Europeans and very, very uh, strongly worded uh, in America. In fact, Europe has given way to evidence that, okay, evidence is correct. But in the Americans, um, they really petition after petition to the various boards of education that history should not, should not be changed. That will be Hindu-centric view or India-centric. It cannot be Harvard University-centric view. Very simple. Next. So, multidisciplinary scientific research we take from, I'm just uh, summing it up, glaciology. Geology is surface of the, down below the earth, the rock formation, the minerals, and uh, what is lying underneath civilizations which were uh, lost. Ecology, you see what kind of uh, atmospheric environment is there, geography, latitude and all that, paleobotany, the uh, fossilized uh, uh, agricultural uh, evidence, astronomy. Yeah, this is another thing. If your number system does not go beyond uh, a, a thousand, or they are writing in uh, Roman numbers, letters, um, the number system, you can never go to millions of years and billions of years, which is history of the, the world. So, rise of civilization, taking it to seven to eight millennia uh, BC, uh, has to be done, revised, are done in the matching of all these evidence, right? So astronomy comes into the picture that there are sky charts given, uh, literally given map on the, in the Vedic literature and in the epics. And many of them uh, have proven right uh, because now NASA has created a planetarium uh, going right up to 90,000 uh, uh, BC. And with that planetarium, uh, planet positions, constellations, one can verify the um, approximate century or decade of the event. So where were Greece, Rome, Egypt, China, Japan, Babylonia, Sumeria, and Germany during all this, these millennia? I would say nowhere. Egypt was uh, partly forest and partly uh, uh, desert. Japan, even today, is uh, hardly any agricultural country. Very difficult for them and it is in the earthquake zone. China is much above uh, uh, the Tropic of Cancer, and it is also facing the North Pole, whereas Indian subcontinent is uh, facing the south side of the Himalaya. India is facing the equator. They are facing the North Pole, so which has a better chance of uh, climate uh, between India and China. Rome and Greece came about uh, uh, late Holocene period uh, when the Ice Age was melting. So the history goes back to like uh, and they say 4,000 years, 3,000 years uh, before common area uh, era. But uh, Actually, when you look at those uh, numbers and dates, 
they come out to like 100 BC or 200 BC or 300 BC. Cleopatra herself was 39 BC. So you can see where are we talking about? What ancient in civilization of Egypt? Unless you go back to the artifacts created by the uh, previous rulers. And that does not give us much of about the civilization. And Germany, Sumeria, uh, they are partly small river valleys and Germany is even not in the equation. Next. Okay, so Holocene period, I have already described, but then to further clarify it, we can take the evidence from uh, uh, people who have studied history of the earth. And uh, these paragraphs are self-explanatory in the sense that the entire eastern half of Canada remained covered by a layer of snow that resisted summer ablation. You see, it was like coming uh, a little bit of thawing and then again back to um, Ice Age. So it was like between 8,000 and 11,000 uh, BC, it was uh, uh, clearing and then not clearing. So 9,000 years ago, the Earth entered a warm period which culminated about 6,000 years before the present day. So the temperature in the center of Asia during the northern summers remained between 2 degrees centigrade and 3.5 degrees centigrade higher than today. Rainfall was more likely higher as well. So we in Indian subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, they had much warmer climate and more water fed rivers. Next. Next. Okay. So astronomy, uh, I'm giving, you know, various kind of examining just uh, little glimpses of uh, various kind of uh, hard sciences where they are taking us. So astronomical evidence, now dating of the epics is fundamental in establishing the historical chronology of ancient Indian history. Bhartiya Itihas. Okay, by the way, Itihas literally means iti that has happened. Ha, somebody has seen. Ash, that he has written it correctly. So it has, the word itself has three things, that something that happened, something witnessed, and somebody witnessed, and somebody wrote it without any bias. So astronomical charts in Sanskrit literature are all in poetry. And as everybody knows that uh, poetry cannot change. And Sanskrit the literature is uh, composed in verses which follow about uh, commonly used 56 uh, rhythm schemes. Whereas in no other language system, they have more than four rhythms, rhythm schemes. But in any case, uh, so it is very hard to uh, translate Sanskrit literature from poetry to poetry. So you have to use prose. And that is where the mistake comes. Because some of the similes and uh, allegories, they elude words. So when the sky charts, which are in poetry, selected from Mahabharata, and Nasa's uh, astronomical uh, uh, chart of the uh, ancient uh, sky. So when the, it was simulated together, it was seen that Veda Vyasa, who wrote uh, from Kurukshetra on the banks of the river Saraswati, and the kind of uh, uh, charts that he produced 
by looking, uh, you can really decipher uh, the correct um, time time frame, and that is determined as 3067 BCE, which takes us back to 5067, and that is the time of Sri Krishna, and Ramayan is even earlier than that. So this date of Mahabharata war is crucial because it determines the rest of the chronology. We cannot go to 1500 BC. We have to go before 3067. There was uh, 10 kings war. Then there was uh, prior to that uh, the Vedic literature composed. And then there were the other river valleys so whole lot was happening before that time, time period, 3067. So obviously the history does not start in 1500 BC. This Mahabharata date is crucial and extremely important. Next. So now we come to marine archeology. span Hardly any, anybody has taken and with seriousness that they were cities like Dwarka, which are underwater now. Why is underwater? It does not require a great genius to figure that out. If the ice age was melting uh, or giving way to, uh, to more water, the water level was rising by several meters eventually the some of the deltas of the rivers they were washed away they are under the water submerged and that can also be verified by satellite imaging it has been verified here is a, an english marine archaeology and uh, he found uh, the remnants of Dwarka, how the stones were wedged together to make the walls and the forts. So the present day Dwarka is uh, quite far away from the Dwarka that existed even before the uh, before the Mahabharata war. So Dwarka where Sri Krishna went, that was uh, much later city. So you can see the uppermost layer is dated 15th century BC, uppermost. The down below is much, much lower. So this is called water erosion of the coastal areas due to the rise of the uh, sea level. Next. So now, impact of incorrect incron uh, chronology. Since the, we have established that the current chronology used in the Indian history or much of the world history, all of the world history actually, it is misleading and confusing and it is not being corrected. Partly because common, uh, common sense uh, is not there or not used, geography, very poor knowledge, and then the tendency to be lazy and just create assumption and generalization. Why bother collecting evidence? So in the process, what happens is that uh, things which originated in India, they are outsourced to China and Rome. I was looking at a label of a, a hand cream and it was written made from original Roman fennel seed. What original Roman fennel seed? Fennel seed has been mentioned in Sanskrit literature many, many millennia before. And what are we talking about here? Similarly, uh, this uh, tree, some tree was mentioned. This essence has come, uh, the rare 
original trees from Lebanon. You see, these are all uh, um, propositions lazily, casually uh, given out to people. And nobody wants to bother about the authenticity of these kind of things. Carl Sagan, doctor of integrative uh, uh, no, uh, Carl Sagan, astrophysicist, and many doctors of integrative medicine in popular shows, they are, ha, Carl Sagan was writing correctly, but doctors of integrative medicine in popular shows being uh, shown, they are showing things ha which happened in India, they happened instead of happening in India, happened in Morocco, Japan, China, Tibet, Korea, everywhere except India. So there's a professor he wrote, Chronology transformed the study of history. And instead of going back to the correct chronology based on evidence, we are stuck to the original 1500 BC. In order to reclaim Indian heritage and the beginning of civilization in, in the tropical belt, not just in India, tropical belt around the earth, it is necessary to demolish these assertions. Otherwise, generations of students will be indoctrinated, uh, not believing that anything ever good happened in India. So that is where chronology is so important. And the establishment of antiquity of ancient India, its civilization, its continuity, has to be correctly uh, described and detailed and based on evidence. Next. This is India's achievement 6,000 years back. Uh, this is bronze st statue, 2500 BC. Now, what does that mean? This statue itself means that uh, Indians knew um, how to make alloy. Bronze is not a natural uh, uh, mineral. Uh, it is alloy of two different minerals. So, and uh, they isolate iron from it because iron oxidizes and weakens the metal. So one can see this is still there. So India's vast knowledge base and its practical use is relevant today and is being used. The only thing is that the credit is not given. So Eurasia was in the dark ages. There was turmoil, religious wars. Till late 15th century, Eurasia, the earth was flat and sun revolved around the earth. Europe's need to find its antiquity they depended, depended on the Bible, on the Greek and Roman civilization. Whereas European civilization has nothing to do with Greek and Roman civilization. The, purely, these are Judeo-Christian civilizations, not Greek and Roman, not Hellenic in any case. Next. So Indian cultural ethos, um, I can, you know, and do in many hours, arts, music, their expression of the aspirations contained in the cultural ethos. So if the culture is denigrated and ridiculed, the artistic expressions lose their underpinning. The glorious spiritual aspect that is lost. In the last 80 years, yoga was ridiculed in the West. Once they put it uh, that uh, it, uh, it, is, uh, it originated in China, suddenly yoga became a norm, a fashion, a thing to do. Next. So reclaiming, as I explained uh, in all the other uh, slides, uh, it's a serious thing to be done and needs to be done. Uh, sooner than later, 
I tried to do it 10 years back, but then, you know, it did not gain traction and the history book right here for the simple reason that uh, academia would dismiss it, would not even consider uh, that, that it, it marries a even first look. Now, one of the uh, person uh, in knowledge in Surinath Kamath, he wrote, chronology was most important for the history of any science. Since history without chronology is like a body without a skeleton. This says it all. So, next. So, contentious issues are still there. Some says India did not have a horse. They had horses, chariots. Iron. They knew iron. Iron was there, but iron was not used in the tools because of its oxidization. So imagine the arrow made of iron falls midway in the air, breaks down. So they made bronze and the copper. Uh, so the, the Pi, Proto-Indo-European language system. What is Proto? Does anybody know what was Proto? What it looked like? What was the script of it? All nonsensical uh, parts of digression. Do deserts, mountains, regions support lasting civilization? Do invasions disrupt socio-political and economic structure or infuse new blood as claimed by Indologists? So all these are issues raised just to digress from the main point that history needs to be rewritten. How to cut a mighty 300-year-old tree? This tree was planted somewhere in 18th century, even before, earlier than that. How to cut it out? Okay, next. So, the cutting out means that you have to build a solid body of uh, academicians who are dedicated enough to face reality, use empirical data, and be bold enough to come out and present. Some of the sources I used, and they are listed here, people can go to the internet search and find many of these papers and uh, deciphering of the language and software of planetoriums from these sources. I use many of these sources, but I also use uh, Indian uh, literary sources. And for that, I had to learn a little bit more about Sanskrit and uh, rhythm schemes. So, um, that says it uh, as for the beginning, where to begin, how to begin, and how to go forward. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, you learned something and enjoyed uh, something which many of you might not have known before. Or if you knew it, maybe it was random, uh, something here, something there. Thank you very much. And thank you, Balaji, for giving me this opportunity uh, to address the audience. And it is my privilege to be part of this uh, show. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kamlesh Kapoor. Really appreciate you spending the time to educate us on, on this matter. Thank you. And of course, your book is available through uh, Amazon. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And it's called uh, History of Ancient India Portraits. Actually, of Portraits of a Nation. Yeah. History of Ancient India. Okay. Thank you once again, Mrs. Kamlesh Kapoor. Thank you.